the robotics and AI revolution. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about, anecdotally, my experience with it, uh, my path through it, um, and try to convey a very key message that will hopefully become apparent uh, by the time I get to the end. It's always important to uh, go back in time and see where this started. Let's go back, you know, 40 years. The first sort of modern revolution, the digital revolution, computation was at the heart of it. But the input to it was still people, and the output was people. People would interpret the results. People would type things in. The killer apps were things like Sexcel and, uh, and word processors. You know, fast forward 20, 30 years, we saw the big data revolution still going on now, where the input process, instead of it just being people, was augmented by having data, automated way, way of getting data and feeding it to computation. But the interpretation was still done by people, looking at the results and making decisions based on that. Where we are right now is an interesting point in time where we still have those things, although computation now can be the size of your fingernail to server farms, distributed sensing, you can sense almost anything anywhere. Same thing for actuation. And you can interact with the physical world and you can close the loop. This is really, it's never been like this before in history. This is a very unique time for us to have this capability. One of the things that people don't think about, though, is what is the bottleneck to widespread adoption, which obviously um, is of interest to folks like yourselves that want to invest in the space, and that is the, the key bottleneck is robustness and reliability. All right? And this is something that um, uh, folks don't often think about. They just look at the latest video and think, oh, great, this is just around the corner. Well, that just isn't the case because of these issues. So my first experience with um, you know, commercialization was Kiva Systems. This is a company that I started with Mick and Pete in 2003. Um, we were called uh, uh, Distrobot when we started the company. Um, we changed the name about a year later because basically we were told that's a very bad name to have in the space. It has the word robot in it. If you want somebody to take you seriously, you got to change your name. So we changed it to Kiva Systems. Um, uh, eight years later, uh, we're roughly 300 people, Amazon bought us. Uh, a lot of people were scratching their heads in 2012. Why would Amazon buy this, this company? Uh, and uh, in 2015, uh, Kiva System was rebranded and is now Amazon Robotics. Amazon has uh, more than 100,000 of these mobile robots in their distribution facilities everywhere. And you can see the video there of the kind of things that um, our robots do. What allowed Kiva to happen was the fact that we had thousands of mobile robots running fully autonomously. Nobody was obviously controlling them. And they were not breaking down. The mean time between failure of mobile robots when we started Kiva was 24 hours. We had a business model where we wanted to have thousands of them running 24-7. Clearly, you can't have a thousand of these things breaking down. It's just not economically viable. We had to come up with new architectures, um, uh, new designs, and the algorithms to allow these things to basically run all the time. In 2008, uh, about five years into Kiva, the part that I was responsible for, the robotics part, was well established and was more about scaling the business. So I decided to go back into academia. Uh, I was a professor and, uh, before and uh, pr professor back when, when I moved to Switzerland. And I started to do research on things that I had put on hold to do Kiva, which was flying machines, drones. So these are some of the things that we've been doing in Switzerland the last 10 years. This is fully autonomous. What we do in terms of research is try to push the boundary of what these autonomous systems can do. When I wear my university professor hat on, I don't care about applications. I just care about pushing the, the boundary. And of course, when I, if I start a company, then I really care about what's the problem that I'm solving, how do I bring value to our clients. Um, back to drones, you know, what can you use them for? These are things that people 
think about. Uh, this is where the market currently is, and it's a multi-billion dollar market already. Inspection, agriculture, the key idea there is to sense things, uh, put drones with cameras or other sensors in hard to reach places. Uh, photography and film, a lot of it is hobbyist, but also professional productions. And package delivery, what you heard from Google and Amazon, the, the idea here of moving packages, especially for the last mile, but also for things like uh, uh, blood samples or um, things that have a high um, uh, value to uh, weight ratio. But there's other things that you can use the technology for. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about, I'm going to show you a little video here of what my company Verity does. Um, uh, and um, uh, it's an application of drones that people don't really think too much about. For us, it's an interesting way to push the boundary of what you can do with this, with, with this technology. So the company's 50 people based in Switzerland. Um, most of them are folks with advanced degrees. Uh, we've done some very high profile events. We're currently on tour with Metallica. We've done the, Madison, uh, the Knicks pregame show, Madison Square Garden last year. Um, we were on Broadway with uh, Cirque du Soleil. We did 400 shows. I'll say a little bit more about that later um, and other uh, events. What's interesting about live events is that it's a, you know, outside of it being an interesting vertical for robotics and AI that is uh, greatly unexplored, not just for drones, but any sort of uh, automation and intelligence, um, it's a great incubator to test this technology. We have over 40,000 flights flying over people. Uh, this is what we've been able to do. Um, uh, our systems are operated, the one on Broadway is operated by the carpenter. That's the name for the folks that run the automation equipment on Broadway. 400 shows, fully autonomous drones operated by their folks. Uh, in Metallica, it's the roadies, they're, they're, the, the folks that are running the system are not us, right? So we're learning huge amounts how to interface people to these types of systems and learning a lot to improve what these things can do. And as was mentioned earlier, <coughs> We're also on tour with Drake at the moment. What's interesting about this technology is it can be used for other things besides live event, and this is, this is the whole incubator aspect uh, of the technology. And here's one way in which you could use them. We've developed this proprietary technology that allows an in unlimited number of objects to localize themselves in space, and we've created these very safe and reliable small drones that can use that technology, and you can use them in any indoor space because you don't have to worry about the, the elements, to do things like data collection, inspection, and, uh, and monitoring. So here you see a, a, an application where they could fly around a warehouse, do things like read barcodes, um, to make sure that things are where they're supposed to be. These things are extremely small and light, right? So you don't have to worry about safety. They don't make very much noise. They're autonomous. They're not being controlled by a human being. They, there's a mission planner that figures out where, where they need to go and what they need to do. They can do things like you know, go ahead and charge, take off, and continue the mission. So this is, a, this, this is an interesting application of the technology for, for indoor spaces. Um, and then there's the whole safety aspect of it. Um, so we did 400 shows on Broadway with our drones. And th stuff like this did not happen, okay? Um, this would have been catastrophic if that, this was from about two years ago. We did 400 shows on Broadway flying over performers, again, fully autonomous. And the reason that we were comfortable doing that was because of this amazing technology that we developed to make vehicles robust to any single point of failure. Um, why is that important? Well, that's one example there. Here you see a, um, uh, uh, another scenario. This drone is actually dropping candy.
Okay, and it hits a. This is this is from last year. I mean, fortunately, no one has been killed yet. But you know, uh, if if we don't start making these drones much more safe and reliable, it's just a matter of time. Especially once you have thousands or millions of them, if you believe in last mile, uh, mile delivery uh, applications. So again, why is it that? we felt comfortable flying on Broadway with our drones that weighed over two pounds, it's because of this fail-safe technology that we developed. Uh, we've created some very interesting algorithms that allow these drones to operate in spite of failures. Here you see Flavio take a huge two by four and shove it into our vehicle, and the vehicle can recover from that event and, and land. Here you see it in slow motion. This technology allows anything to fail motors, propellers, batteries, electronics, you name it, this thing can still fly. So it's an interesting business model of using live events as an incubator to develop this technology, and now we're actively licensing uh, this technology, and hopefully uh, it will find its way in every single drone that you, that you find, make them much safer and reliable. I'm gonna close off here with a few minutes that I have remaining to kind of emphasize, even though it seems, you know, uh, that I've been at the center of a lot of these uh, innovations, the reality of it is, is the future is impossible to predict. Uh, it's very difficult to figure out what is, what is going to be a winner and what is going to be a loser. And I have three anecdotes to, to um, kind of highlight this point. So the first is, is with Kiva. Um, uh, you know, Kiva was bought by Amazon in 2012. Uh, it's now Amazon Robotics. A lot of folks have, it was kind of an eye-opener for a lot of companies to realize that robotics has this huge potential and that we really need to start investing in it. The anecdote I want to I say about it is that in 2008, in February, Mick and I went for, went for lunch and uh, we talked about whether we should do a fundraise. We were close to cash flow positive. We had a great pipeline. Everything looked great. So there really was no reason for us to take money. We had lunch and we thought about it. We said, yeah, you know, actually we can get very good valuation and you never know what's going to happen. And of course, we all know what happened in 2008. We had just finished our fundraising, so we were actually able to ride that out. If that lunch conversation had gone differently, Kiva probably would not have remained a viable business and things would have been very, very different. Just this very little thing is impossible to predict. Right? Another most recent example is Rethink Robotics. You know, Pioneer and Collaborative Robotics, they just shut down. Um, and, you know, what went wrong? Um, amazing pedigree. You know, Rod Brooks, uh, one of the founders of the, the first real consumer robotics company, iRobot, uh, MIT professor, visionary. Um, great team, great premise, the whole uh, Collaborative Robotics. You know, uh, the MIT Technology Review article really says it. It's really hard to be successful in this space. And I'm sure that people will go back and say, well, the reason they failed is because of this and this and that. But all those decisions, you know, it's very hard to predict ahead of time what these things, uh, what's going to pin out and what's not. And the last one is, you know, uh, we hear about artificial intelligence all the time. We had some recent breakthroughs, um, AI beating uh, the AlphaGo master, um, Lee Sedol, uh, in something that people didn't think was going to happen for a long, long time. Go is, Alpha Go, uh, Go is much, much um, uh, more complex in terms of strategies than chess, so it's a very different thing to make an AI that could beat someone uh, in this game. We see on the, on the right-hand side there the huge advances that have been made on image classification. And a lot of this is enabled by neural nets. The thing is, if you go back to the 90s when I was a graduate student, if you told anybody that you were working on neural nets, you were a second-class citizen, right? It was looked down upon. You're working on neural nets. Neural nets died twice. Once was in the 60s and 70s, and it died again in the 90s. No one serious was doing research in, in uh, neural nets. And if you had told someone from that time, neural nets are going to be huge in 20 years, they would just, you know, you just laugh at you, right? No one predicted this, right? Except for the few diehards that kept doing research in the area, but those folks were discounted, right? No one really predicted this, the impact that this would have. There's a lot of reasons why. I'm not going to get into any of them. The thing is, it is impossible to predict. So to conclude, what's the lesson here? Um, the lesson here is that you've got to be diversified. The theme of robotics and AI, I think, has huge potential in the medium to long term, and in the short term, of course, but specifically in the medium to long term. But it's very difficult to point to any companies that are going to be winners and losers. And in, in hindsight, it is, right? But to do it forward is a much more difficult task. And I think you have to believe in the space. And I think you have to make sure that you pick the companies that are representative of the space and, uh, and, uh, you know, and stick it out. So with that, I'll stop and thank you. <laughs>